Welcome to the 12 video in the Just In Case series, sponsored by Quality Equality, an OD consultancy firm based in Oxford, United Kingdom. My name is Mayan Cheung Judge, and I am the director of Q&A. This series is called Just In Case. Just in case you need reminding of something, just in case you didn't know something, just in case you want to be refreshed about something and just in case you want to know a topic better. Today I'm incredibly excited because one of the most influential thinker in the field not only is very dear to me, his first book, Productive Workplace, let me just hold that up, um, is one of the two most influential books in my life as a practitioner. Also his famous quote, to bring humanity back to the workplace has become the mantra of my practice. Throughout my life um, as an OT practitioner, I always refer back to his work. And today I'm so excited that um, Melvin Weisbord, a pioneer contributor to the field of OT, a brilliant thought leader, a professional author, a business executive, a very well-known journalist, um, an organization consultant, a researcher, a future search method founder, and a co-founder of the Future Search Global Network, and not to mention a very well-known jazz musician. So it is an incredibly privilege that Melvin decided to let me interview him, to share his wisdom and story from his practice. And I am so excited because at the end, he also agreed to play some jazz music for us. His um, work as a jazz musician has gone global and viral. And the link to his senior songbook is actually listed at the end of the video. And at the end, he will also close our interview with something really significant for the incoming OD practitioner. And so this is a conversation with lots of story because this is the way that Melvin really teach essential messages through stories and through his narrative. So have a cup of tea, sit in a comfortable chair and expect to be not just entertained, but deeply moved by a man who dedicated his life to restore humanity back at the workplace. So enjoy. Melvin, just, I want to say thank you for giving us a time to just have a chat with you about your career in OD, your life currently. And, I, um, and I'm getting super excited that you will play some music for us at the end. So <laughs> shall, we, shall we ask you to say hi to the audience first, and then I'll ask you the first question. Hello, everybody. This is Marvin Weisbord. I started in the organization development profession about 1969, and uh, I've been retired since 19, 2013. I guess I retired in Heathrow Airport between planes uh, when I said to my wife, I don't have to do this anymore. We, we had stood in one line too many that day and haven't been on an airplane since. Anyway, here, here we are again. Melvin, I wonder whether you can share with the audience, how did you actually get into the field of OD? Uh, largely by accident. Um, when I, just before my 37th birthday, I left a family business that I had been part of since I was a child in one way or another. And by that time, I had, uh, I had five years of college. I had, I had six actually in three state universities. I taught in one state university. I studied in an Ivy League university. I had two degrees in journalism. I had been a Navy journalist. I taught journalism at Penn State uh, and had written professionally for uh, about 15 years at that point, off and on. I'd written a lot of magazine articles and written three books by then. 
And I left that business for reasons we don't need to go into and uh, really didn't know what I would do with the rest of my life, uh, except probably write for a living because I had contacts with the magazines and I knew enough about how to do that, that we could have eked out a living, although it's a precarious business being a freelance writer. So I was sitting in my office working on on an article, I guess, for a magazine and the phone rang and it was a friend of mine from the Society of Magazine Writers named Bernie Asbell. This was an organization I belonged to in its early years that included a rather well-known, some very well-known people who weren't well-known yet, like Betty Friedan, who wrote The Feminine Mystique, and Al Toffler, who wrote The Third Wave, and Bill Lederer, who wrote The Ugly American. And I was one of the younger members. And Bernie, had, uh, whose name you probably don't know, but he wrote 10 or 11 books, and he was well known as an education writer. And we were friends because we used to make music together. And he he called me and he said, would you be interested in doing a consulting job with me at the Ford Foundation? And I said, Bernie, what do you mean consulting job? I don't know anything about consulting. <laughs> and he said, he said, yes, you do. He said, all we do is we interview people and we write a report. That's what you do all the time when you're writing magazine articles. I said, oh, that's all there is to it. He said, yeah. And he said, uh, besides, they pay $100 a day. And I had no income at that point. I said, oh. And then he said, each. And I said, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I, that was my first consulting assignment. And I learned an enormous amount doing that work. I mean, that's, you know, I could tell stories about that for a long time. Uh, when we, re well, I won't go into it, but as a result of that, I had, I got a couple more assignments from Ford. And then one night at a cocktail party when I was telling the story about Ford to some friends and getting pleasantly high on martinis, um, a buddy of mine who is still a great buddy, we've grown old together, said, you know, we need something like what you're describing at our medical school. He was a uh, clinician at Women's Medical College of Pennsylvania, which was the oldest private medical school in the United States and the only medical school exclusively for women at that time. Ooh. And probably the only one ever because they shortly afterwards became integrated. So I said, well, what do you need? And he said, well, we've got this committee working on planning and they don't know what to do. Would you come and talk to the, to the dean? I said, okay. So I went to the medical school and talked to him and I said, well, you know, all I really need to do is interview these people and write a little report. But by then I had also written several articles on OD because it interested me from my working life in my father's business where I had worked where I had created self-managing work teams without fully understanding that that was not a norm in the business world. I thought everybody did that because I had read Douglas McGregor's book, The Human Side of Enterprise. Yes. Yes. And so I had that in my background and I had met Rensis Lickert writing articles and I had, uh... so I said, gee whiz, you know, as I talked to these department heads and the hospital people in the school, uh, they really could use some kind of integrative procedure for making this planning system. Otherwise, there because there was huge turmoil and conflict in the medical school. The dean was part time, as most deans were in those days. They would uh, they would do deaning in the morning and surgery in the afternoon or see patients. It was where they would teach classes. And so I made a proposal to these people about how to do an integrated planning system that would involve students and nurses and doctors and clinician, uh, clinical scientists and hospital managers and department chair and board members. Mm -hmm. Grace Kelly's mother was a member of the board. The Kelly family lived in the neighborhood. I mean, it was, it was a small world in those days. 
And that became my first major consulting project. Out of that grew a whole bunch of work in that medical school uh, and later in, with nine other medical schools around the United States. Um, and I consulted to women's medical school through the very, very emotional turmoil yeah. that followed the Nixon admissions, uh, administration's requirement that in order to maintain their federal funding, they would have to admit men. There could be no more one sex higher education schools in the United States and also get federal money. And they were totally dependent on federal money because not only were they the oldest private medical school, they were probably the poorest as well. Mm -hmm. And so we had a planning group that I had helped organize who worked through the future mission and whether or not to admit men. And they finally decided on 10% of the next freshman class would be men six out of 60, and that began the integration of Women's Medical College. At that time, uh, only 6% of all medical students in the United States were women. If you can yeah. imagine, that, this would have been 1969, yeah. 70, 6%. And Women's Medical College had trained 50% of all the women doctors in the United States. My goodness. So you can imagine why the alumni and the students did not want men, because men could go anywhere, and for women it was hard to get in the other schools. Now I should also say within three years, as I moved around other medical schools in other states uh, doing research and, uh, and consulting, the numbers grew exponentially until now. I think it's a bit more than 50% of all medical students are women. But we saw the change happen very quickly in the early 70s. That's great. One of the government policies that had a huge impact on medical education. Anyway, that, so that was my entry into the consulting business. I, I actually had clients before I really knew what to do. <laughs> and uh, and when about did... that time, when that's, you know, the, the interesting thing about the consulting businesses. To be a, a successful consultant, you have to have skills, you need experience, and you need clients. But all you really need are clients, because without them, you cannot get the skills and the experience. Yes. And I was fortunate to build from one project to another. And because of my writing background and my management background, which I thought I had wasted uh, in my father's business. I didn't realize how significant it would be to my, my future career. I was able from one client to another to transfer what I had already, what I already knew and had learned to new situations and new settings. So that's great because um, in, in the recent research that Prof. Jemison and I do on use of self, many people, when we ask them when what type of development activities you need, they say opportunity to practice and practice and practice. And that's what you mean. But I want to ask you, when do you come across the NTL bunch, you know, or these other contemporary oh. that you have? In 19, this would have been 1969 when I started with Women's Medical College. About 1970, I met a group of local consultants who, who had been to Bethel. And they also, some of them were part of a program at Drexel University that was turning out one of, one of the earliest master's degrees in, in the OD business. And they invited me to join them in helping create a OD network chapter in Philadelphia. And so we hosted the one of the very earliest OD network meetings in 1970 at a local Marriott in Philadelphia. And that was the first conference I had ever attended in this field. And there I attended a session by Tony Patella and Pete Block, Peter Block, who would later become my partners. And I was blown away with what they were doing and with experiential learning and business cases, because I understood what they were up to. 
And so when I, uh, I got to know them, and then I, I called Tony on the, I was writing an article and I interviewed Tony for my article. And then I invited him to help me with a client. And then Peter invited me to help him with a client. That's so research and engineering. And as I got to know them, Tony said, you know, if you really want to learn how to do this, you've got to go to Bethel, Maine, to NTL, to a consultation skills course run by Mike Blansfield. Actually, Mike was teaching this course in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Tony said, next summer, I'm going to be an intern on his staff. And why don't you sign up for that course? So I did. It was a two-week consultation skills. And uh, that's where I learned the live client model. Because Mike said, OK, you're, all going, you're in teams of four. He said, you're going to go and find a client in the community. And you're going to consult to them for three days during this two-week workshop. How do you do that, Mike? He said, that's up to you. He said, you know, try the yellow pages. <laughs> <laughs> so we did. <laughs> and we found a little manufacturing company in New Hampshire that was willing to entertain us coming to consult with them. So I got to do my first team building. Anyway, at the end of those two weeks, I was having a drink with Mike Glansfield and reminiscing about this unbelievable experience. And Mike said, I am going to recommend you for a professional membership in NTL Institute. I said, wow, that's very nice, Mike. Now, at that time, NTL was still quite elitist. They had the, uh, forget what they called the uh, legacy members, mostly academics who had started this thing. But that, that was very, you know, it was very uh, elitist. You had to be recommended. You had to pass like, an interview and all that stuff. But professional members were people who were actually doing the work. And we were like adjunct members, but we could go to workshops. And so I, uh, so I was then, he said, you'll, he said, he said, I'd like to have you back as an intern next summer. And I said, wonderful. When I told Tony about it, he said, you know, Mike just gave you everything that he has to offer. <laughs> membership in NTL and an internship in this workshop. And I said, wow, it's wonderful. Okay. Two weeks later, Mike Blansfield died of a heart attack oh. at the age 48. So that's, that's sad. So now I was bereft partly because I liked him so much and partly because there, there's my opportunity gone. And that fall, I went to an OD network somewhere in the Midwest and Warner Burke was there and I met Warner. I think I had interviewed him because I had done an article on OD for IBM's magazine. And I told Warner this story. And Warner said, I will honor Mike's commitment to you and give you an internship next summer. And I said, Warner, I, I haven't even been to a TIG group. He said, well, oh no, that's, let's see. No, at that point I had been, I had written an article on T groups for the New York Times Magazine. Uh, and, but I said, that's my only experience. I don't have a, he said, well, I'll make you a, 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 an, an, a, an intern in a T group, but you'll have to pay your own way. And I said, fine, I'll do it. So that got to be my first apprenticeship in a T group. And I had three or four more after that. And by the, third or fourth one I was getting paid and that's also and then by by 72 I was a full-time staff on a consultation skills lab I met Gunnar Yelholt from Denmark who opened the door to Europe for me and um, it also and then by 1975 Gail Silverman and I were running the two-week labs ourselves on uh, Haverford College campus in Philadelphia under NTL's aegis, and we did that for seven years. So that kind of, it, it happened very fast. Kind of one thing led to another, but suddenly I was an NTL member. And when, and so I was able, to, oh, and I won, I, I was one of the winners of a contest to create new three-day what they called modules at Bethel. And I submitted a proposal for an organizational diagnosis module, which was accepted in 72. So the same summer I was working in consultation skills, I was at Bethel doing a 
consult a, uh, a diagnosis lab. And then Tony invited me to join him in a team building lab. So in 74, when NTL blew up and they decided to totally reorganize it, the new reorganizers of NTL who included, I remember Peter Vale and Edie Seashore and a couple of others, asked me to be one of the 60 people who would come together to figure out a new, a new model for NTL. Institute. So in 69, I couldn't spell OD and didn't know what it was. And in 74, there I was consulting for a living and helping to reorganize NTL. And that same year, Tony and Peter and I decided to consolidate our businesses and we became full time partners and were for the next 20 years. Um, so it all, it was like a blur. I mean, I was one client after another and learning I had by then I had worked with GD Searle, ARA services. Oh, God, I don't remember several business clients and I'd been in a lot of medical schools. I teamed up with Paul Lawrence at Harvard Business School. We did we did Lawrence Flourish research in medical schools and kind of redefined the way those systems are managed or could be managed. Well, your your experience, your consultancy experience is so clear to those of us who read any publication from you, because you were very clear in explaining uh, both the process and also your case experience. Um, in reading your thing, Melvin, I have a suspicions that you are a theory nerd. I don't know whether that's a good word or not. And, and did I make that up or do you actually quite bias about working theory like Lewin said? Would you tell us more? There's nothing as practical as the good theory. Yeah. No, I took that one to heart. I was in the, uh, as an adult, after I had been in the Navy and been a teacher at Penn State and so on, I, I was working about half time in my father's business forms manufacturing business while I wrote and went to Penn for a while. And uh, so I learned a lot about business management. But in those 10 years or so, I'd never had a workshop. and I'd never studied management until I began to think about writing in the OD until until a friend of mine gave me a copy of Douglas McGregor's book when I was having problems in the business. I guess I, that, now it all comes back to me. I wrote a lot about this is how the work team started and, and how I got into theoretically into OD. And in reading McGregor's book, I, I, that was my first exposure to theory in this whole field. I mean, I was, I knew a lot about journalism but I didn't know anything about management theory. I was just doing it every day. I mean, we had a little business. We had blacks and whites working together. We had we had a uh, mail order order fulfillment business and a manufacturing operation in the printing plants. We were selling business forms by mail, so we were manufacturing them and marketing and shipping them. We were a mini Amazon, very mini. <laughs> And uh, so I had learned a lot about all the aspects of business in a very little business, but one that was well, it was national because we shipped all over the United States. So I and when I read McGregor's theory X theory Y, it, it kind of blew my mind. I mean, I didn't know you were allowed to think of these kinds of thoughts that uh, that that the, that the theory that your theory of management determined what you did every day. If you believed theory X that people were basically sinful and, and not trustworthy and that they behaved like children and had to be ordered around and guided every moment of the way, then you set up very tight supervision and you had time clocks on the wall and you were a disciplinarian and you uh, made them toe the line and you got very upset if they took an extra five minute break. And, uh, and all that kind of, that was theory X in action. And I said, wow, I look around me, I see it. 
And that's not who my father was, and it's not who I was, but that's certainly the environment we lived in. We were fish swimming in water, and that was the water. And then McGregor said, on the other hand, if you believe that people are basically good and, and that they have the potential to change and they have the potential for creativity, and most people don't use all of the potential they have because they don't know they have it, but they can be trusted because to be to become trustworthy, you have to experience trust. And uh, I said, gee, that's that's I really do believe that. But what would I do differently Monday morning? Because that was the way I operationalized theory. Every and every theory I learned subsequently, it's what does this have to do with what I'm doing, and could I put it into action? So. So when I met Rensis Lickard and interviewed him and began learning about his new patterns of management and his theories of human resource management, uh, I understood what he was talking about. I understood his cost reduction sharing plan idea, and I understood his graphs and charts on how you move a system from authoritarian to more participative. What are the actual things that happen vis-a-vis -vis training and supervision and discipline mm -hmm. and so on that really result in statistically significant changes in the way people perceive their work lives? I got that even, and I knew a little bit about statistics from my journalism courses. So there you have a, a short story. So when I wrote Productive Workplaces, I was attempting to integrate all of the theories I had learned that were significant to me. And one of the big criticisms of that book was, well, you left out, you know, and it could be whatever this person's, why didn't you get into Blake and Mouton? Why don't you have more about Argerus? Why don't you, as if I were writing a survey of the OD field instead of my experience and my roots as I understood them. So in writing that book, I rehabilitated Frederick Taylor, who was uh, because I discovered different aspects of Taylor that I could relate to from my work and my background and actually consulting to the company where he had originally formulated scientific management 80 years earlier. So when I read the principles of scientific management, I understood in a theoretical way what he was up to. He was trying to rationalize work in such a way that he could improve labor management relations and make authoritarian supervision unnecessary. Very few people ever understood that. I did, but I worked at Bethlehem Steel, where the only thing that survived of, 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 of Taylor's theory was time and motion study, the engineering part, which he always considered a tiny part of his whole theory. Right. So those are some of my theoretical thoughts that I haven't thought for a long time. But I can but I can tell you where I came out on this spectrum. Because yes. maybe that's that's the important thing. I ended up integrating human relations theory and training, the best the the T group experience and the experiential learning events that grew out of t-group learning with socio-technical systems thinking which primarily came out of the uk uh, during the uh, during world war ii based on the work of eric trist and later fred emery the australian who joined eric at tavistock institute after the war i integrated those two perspectives uh, one was very intellectual and one was very experiential, but they came together in me because I understood such tech theory because I had implemented it before I knew what it was with my self-managing work teams, which is what Eric discovered in the British coal mines. He discovered self-managing work teams working underground in response to a new technology. So I understood all that. And out of that came my came future search as a kind of three-day integration of all of those theoretical perspectives. But what uh, 
uh, what I didn't, I don't know if I emphasized this in my books or not, but the conclusion that I came to when it vis a vis systems change with my learning curve, you know, the whole idea of everybody improves whole systems rather than experts solve your problems or groups solve problems for themselves, was that the unit of change to be significant has to be the system. The unit of change cannot be the individual. Coaching, counseling is great. You know, you, there's no such thing as too many interpersonal skills. I never heard people accused of being having more interpersonal skill than they need. And there's no such thing as too much group skill. Oh my God, she is so good at that that it, uh, you don't hear things like that. I mean, you can you can refine all of that till the cows come home. And it's existentially right to do that. It's not the same as systems change. Systems change is when you get the entire system functioning at a new level of capability. When you get a group of people trying to do something significant together to do things they didn't know they could do in a way that was more satisfying to them and better for society. That is the purpose of future search. And in order to do that, you cannot focus on dysfunctional people in the group, and you cannot focus on one if one of the eight groups in the room isn't doing the best that groups can do, even though they've never done any of this before. You have to focus on how do they perform as a group of 64 people in that room when they're trying to figure out the common ground and what it is they really want to do together. So the unit of change for me became the whole system the other stuff's relevant, but it's in the background. Don't get distracted. The And the change, the things that need to change, which are more important from the standpoint of systems change, are structural. Who is allowed to do what? Who needs to be involved in doing this? What are the policies that we work under? What are the procedures? that we follow, what are the systems, what are the rules of engagement for this enterprise? What are the programs we're willing to invest money in? What are the practices that people value? Those are all structural issues. Those are something human beings can actually change. Now, oddly enough, when you start thinking about that, you will always come back to leadership because there are leaders who instinctively know how to do that and without any courses at all, and leaders who have MBAs from four different leaders from four different business schools and cannot do any of it very well. Um, so leadership does make a difference, but just changing the leader is not enough if the leader can also involve people in creating policies, procedures, and practices that are better for the enterprise and better for the people themselves. And only the people who do the work can do that. So it's, I think the whole system in the room is probably my central contribution to, to the field of OD. Melvin, you, you have so much more contribution to the field than what we can think at this moment and, and list them. So maybe this is the right time for for me to, on behalf of the community, to express our collective gratitude to you for what you have done to the field and to so many of us um, OD practitioner. So um, one of the things that I always uh, was struck by your teaching is you've done some of the most significant teachings through stories. So may I ask whether you could actually think about some story to share with us, particular audience that never sat under your feet. Do you want to, I don't know how many stories you want to hear, but there's, I've because I've written a lot, I think I wrote an article about this for the OD practitioner. One of the last articles I ever wrote was called Learning to Fly and Other Life Lessons. Did I send you that one? Or no. Remember the, the Learning to Fly article? Within the, it was in the ODP too, but uh, it was how I learned to fly in 1953 at, at the University of Illinois while I was a senior. Now, in 1953, that was just 50 years after the Wright brothers first flew an airplane. So until 50 years before, 
human beings had never done this before, which is fly a powered aircraft in such a way that they could get it in the air, keep it in the air, and make it go where they wanted to go, which was the Wright brothers' formula for a successful flying machine. They were systems thinkers. That was the interest. So here I was 50 years later, uh, learning to do something that no human being had ever done uh, until the year my father was born. And now I was learning to do this. Most students were able to solo in about eight hours of, of instruction in an airplane at that point. <clears throat> and I was already up to 10 because I was a very slow learner and was wondering whether I would ever get the solo in an airplane because I got very good at taking the airplane off, flying it around the traffic pattern and making the approach. But hitting the ground, touching down was something I, you know, making, mastering that landing was a problem. So I'd come in low, I would bounce the front wheels. These were tail draggers. These were old fashioned airplanes with a tail wheel and front wheel, bounce the front wheels, bounce 20 or 30 feet into the air. And then the instructor would have to take over and make sure we didn't crash at that point. Uh, and he would say to me, okay, you got to go around again, try it again. So the next time I'd be super careful and I'd pull back and stick too far and drop into the runway from 10 or 15 feet high and we'd go crash. And he'd say, okay, he said, that was a controlled crash. He said, now you've got to learn how to put this thing down perfectly. So it took me an extra two hours to figure that one out. And uh, finally, the day came when the instructor sits, you know, you've gone around a few times and made some landings, and he gets out of the plane and says to you, okay, it's all yours. Solo it, take it around on your own. And the day that happened to me, I said to him, Jack, he roared this over the engine because the engine was still running. He got out. He said, okay, it's yours. I said, do you sure you want to let me do this? We're shouting to each other. He said, yeah, he said, look, he said, look over there. And he pointed to the parallel runway where another student was landing a plane exactly like mine. He said, that's the best student I ever had. He never makes a mistake. He said, I have to, to deliberately foul him up on final approach in order for him to learn how to get out of that problem, to correct his mistakes. He said, I'm not worried about you because you know how to correct every mistake there is. <laughs> and I flew around and when I had my flight test with the federal examiner, I made perfect landings. And for the next 25 years, I never, I never had a mistake I couldn't, I couldn't correct. And I made several of them, but that was one of the greatest lessons I ever learned for the OD business. Because, you know, we were living in a world where they do it right the first time was a mantra. And, oh, my God, you haven't expressed your feelings. There's something wrong about you, with you. And, you know, people would, do, you know, people do all kinds of strange things when they don't have perfect skills. And nobody's trained in everything. So I learned that, you know, in order to do things right, you got to do them wrong. And that's just part of learning. <laughs> And my, you know, and I treated my family. We were in this together as an action research exp experience, and uh, you know, we'd get together on Saturday mornings. The kids hated this and said, "Okay, here's all the stuff that needs to be done around the house, and let's figure out who's going to do what." And uh, they still remember those days, but uh, I see them do it with their kids too. <laughs> but, uh, but thank you. So I never really separated OD from from my daily life. I just thought that, you know, every it's, you have to learn. The, the best you can do is learn from your experience. And, of course, the more emotional you become, the more hooked you become by other people, the harder it is to learn. And so that's where personal growth and these other kinds of things become important, too. And I had five, five glorious years of doing these men's labs with John Weir, who was the premier personal growth trainer in the United States. And a lot of what we learned from John influenced the future search model. John and Joyce Weir. I, did you ever meet the Weirs? 
No, but no, I didn't. Yeah. But they ran uh, into your personal growth labs for 40 years. They called them self differentiation labs. And self differentiation did not mean me differentiating myself from you. It was me differentiating the many parts of myself and integrating them. And what, what I could learn from you was how I put you together inside of me and whether that had uh, positive or negative emotion or whether I was indifferent. But whatever my reaction to you was a great learning experience for me. It had nothing to do with you. So feedback went went out the window with, uh, with us when we did our workshops. There was no need for feedback as long as you could express what you, what you saw and what you felt and not make judgments about you. We did away with defensiveness as a category. We did away with resistance to change as a category. They're, they're not helpful if people are, are need, because as soon as you label people with a pejorative label, they can't get out from under it. And, uh, Excellent. Well, that you offer us so much to think about, and um, nobody would believe that um, you retired so many years ago because all these are still life to you. But I want to ask you after your retirement, well, throughout your life, music is important, but I wonder whether whether you can tell us a bit about what do you do with the jazz music since your retirement? Yes, well, all my, all my life I dreamed about playing jazz piano since I first saw Nat King Cole perform at a high school dance when I was 15 years old. But I, and I banged away on the piano for decades, and I was never any good. I couldn't play with other people. I thought I had a bad ear, because in fourth grade, the teacher said, you stand in the back row and just move your lips, because I, I thought I couldn't carry a tune, which was not true. But I had to, you know, it was a lot in my head. And in, in my 60s, after starting one of the personal growth labs, these men's labs I did with John, I decided I'm going to get serious about this. And I had, I, I got a teacher off and on, and I started to learn how to do it. But it wasn't until I got into my 70s that I got serious and began to invite people to the house and began in a very tentative way to try to play with other people. Because I discovered in my labs that everybody felt like they were bad musicians, even the best musicians felt that way. And uh, in the, in, and when I was in my early 70s, I finally met a teacher, actually a jazz guitar player named Chuck Anderson, who was still my teacher. I've been studying with him for 15 years. I had a lesson with him yesterday and still learned some things I didn't know before. So any problem I'm working on musically, I take to Chuck and we work on it. When Dorothy and I decided we just had to get out of our house, the criteria I was looking for was an apartment big enough for my piano. And I had to be able to continue to bring my friends there on Saturday morning to have jam sessions, because that's what we were doing. That's all I expected to do. So when we came here, the people in charge said, yes, you can bring your your people here, we've got a pianos in two different rooms. And so I, I said to the head of dining, she was telling me that I said, you want to do an experiment? I mean, here we are with OD. I said, suppose I ask my band if they want to play here one night and uh, see if anybody wants to come. And she said, sure, that'd be great. Make it Thursday night because that's our first night. We're open and nobody comes. So I asked the band. They didn't want to do it. So we settled on Saturday night instead. And she agreed. So we did our first action research experiment on a Saturday night. We put together a little program of songs that we'd been doing. We had a jam session for 40 or 50 people sitting in this little dining room. And they loved it. And I saw them singing along. I said, gee, that's interesting. A lot of these old folks know the words. Well, of course, it's my era there. We're playing songs they know. And uh, so they invited us to do it again and again and again. And now we've done 70 gigs here. We until the virus. We were playing twice a month in the music room. We have a following of, of 80 year old groupies who, uh, <laughs> who know all the songs and uh, 
we do a sing along every time and we and you know and we the group has now been together for about 10 or 12 years so we were playing 10 times a month here and now we're not playing at all and we're and we're bereft okay. and we'll start to move us into the piano room play that will be great thank you I will sense myself carrying this anyway that's how I finally realized my dream and the longer we played here the better we've all gotten so in the course of doing this i finally learned how to play the piano and to play with a group so we made quite a few videos and this little uh, this record we we made the senior songbook has gone viral and it's had thousands of hits on youtube and it's it's kind of being played everywhere and we had not expected that can you see me in the piano yes thank you can, can you, you can see the keys we can see the keys this this is my wonderful european piano it has a very pure kind of tone which um, is what won me to it because i could accompany singers with it is a foggy day in London town. Oh, George Ira Gershwin. And uh, I hope it's a sunny day there today. But I thought I'd play that in honor of my friends and colleagues in London. Thank you. Melvin, the last question I have for you is, do you have any passing message for the newcomers in the OD field? Oh, my. You know, my passing message is this. People always ask about the, what's the future of OD, and I have no idea what the future of OD is, but I can tell you this. The future never comes. The future is built on whatever it is we're doing today. There is nothing, there, we only work in the present. The future is something we imagine, it doesn't come. The future is becoming the past from one second to another. Today is the only day we have. So the future of OD are those of you who are listening to my voice. And if you want to know the future of OD, look at what you're doing today. 
because that's establishing the foundation for whatever is going to happen tomorrow. And what you do, and tomorrow you'll do it better if you've learned something today and the day after that will be better than that. And collectively you are inventing the future of OD. It's not up to me. We're gone. We're history. I'm a dinosaur. But I'm happy to know that if you can draw in my work, I know you're going to take it into whole new places because we're living in a virtual world now. But you know, Zoom is about getting the whole system in the room. So there may be hope for the species yet. Excellent. Marvin, thank you so, so much for investing time. I have no idea how you feel from listening to Melvin, but it really is a touching moment for me to hear about how he, in his very humble way to talk about his entry to OD and his connection with some of the very big thinker in NTL OD and some of the lessons, the flying lessons was incredible. Remind us about fragility of all practitioner, that we will all make mistakes, but knowing how to forgive ourselves, get up and go again is a really important criteria for us moving towards mastery. So Melvin, may I, on behalf of everybody, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with the group. And it's been a real, real privilege for me to be able to talk to you. And it warmed my heart to see you. And I want to say it once again, I am deeply grateful for your contribution to the life of the of myself and in the field of OD. I'm thankful for your music and also for sharing your closing message. For those of you who have not read Productive Workplace, and I recommend highly that uh, you will purchase it, the newest uh, edition, because that book has really transformed my practice of OD. And to hear more about his music, please see the link in the description of this video and find his bibliography. And a big thank you to Melvin and to all of you who come to watch this video. Stay well, stay safe and continue to do great work to bring humanity back in the workplace.